Hola, muy buenas tardes con todos. Muchísimas gracias por estar aquí con nosotros el día de hoy con American University y Education USA. Hoy tenemos una presentación muy especial para las personas que les interese estudiar una maestría de Relaciones Internacionales. Entonces, si tienen cualquier pregunta durante el webinar, por favor, vayan poniéndolas en el chat y con mucho gusto al final de la presentación vamos a estar contestándolas. No olviden que eh, con el programa de crédito beca tenemos unos maravillosos convenios. Con American University tenemos un convenio espectacular del 50% del valor de la matrícula. Entonces, la verdad es una muy buena oportunidad. Y como ya saben, el programa crédito beca es una convocatoria es una financiación de hasta 50 mil dólares para programas de maestrías en el exterior. La convocatoria abre el 10 de enero. Pueden encontrar más información en colfuturo.org, en la sección de programas y luego programa crédito beca, encontrar en los requisitos. Entonces, comencemos. Hoy les presento a Gia. Ella es representante de American University y tenemos a David Ramírez, que es un eh, alumno de esta maravillosa institución y también es beneficiario de Colfuturo, del de programa de crédito beca. Entonces, si tienen preguntitas para él, también los van poniendo en el chat. Y bueno, Gia, David, thank you so much for being here today. We're really happy to have you. Um, the floor is yours, Gia. Uh, thank you so much once again. Great. Thank you so much for the introduction, Bianca. Um, hello, everyone from Washington, D.C. And uh, my name is Gia Gia. I am the Senior Director of Graduate Enrollment Management at American University School of International Service. Um, so in my role at the university, I work very closely with all the students who are looking to apply for the master's and PhD programs in international affairs um, at SIS. So I just want to say um, it's wonderful to meet all of you in the virtual space. As Bianca mentioned, I am also joined today by um, a current SIS master's student, David Ramirez, who is um, waving at you right now. And then he will um, join me for the Q&A session after the presentation portion of um, this webinar. So with that, I want to get started um, to share some information with you about um, what studies in international affairs in the United States are like. What are the um, options you can explore and what kind of jobs people typically get graduating from these degrees? But before I get started on the actual degrees themselves, I want to share with you the story of some of our, some of our alumni. So the first story I want to share with you is um, actually the story of Marcella, who is originally from Colombia. And uh, Marcella graduated from Uni Norte before she came to the United States. She studied science, communication, and journalism um, as part of her undergraduate degree. And, and she was a very busy undergraduate because in addition to taking courses, she also participated in the model OAS program. Um, so she's already a little bit in the international affairs space, even though her bachelor's degree itself was not in international affairs per se. So when Marcella came to SIS, she was part of the Intercultural and International Communication Program. Um, this is a degree that looks at cross-cultural communication, um, global strategic communication, um, and it also looks at you know, topics such as cultural and public diplomacy, right? So how do different governments have programs such as Kofuturo, let's say, or the Fulbright Program to help promote um, international and cross-cultural exchange. And um, Marcella was a very active student in the IC program because while she was a student, she also served as a consultant um, working on communication and organizational development. Um, she worked with a client that is based in China, and she actually worked with a group of fellow students to design and implement an educational assessment program um, for the school in China. After Marcella graduated, um, she worked as a consultant for a global uh, for an organization called the Global Partnership for Education. So this is consistent with the consultancy that she did when she was a student. And after that stint, she started working um, as an IT analyst for the World Bank, which is where she is today. So this is the story of Marcella. And now let's move on to look at a second story. 
So this is the story of Jose from Ecuador. And uh, Jose, unlike Marcella, um, Jose did not uh, did not study anything in the social sciences field, right? He studied petroleum engineer for his bachelor's degree, and he actually worked for 10 years as a petroleum engineer in Ecuador. Um, during his time at SIS, he chose to study global environmental policy and its intersection with international development work. So how does the global, global environmental policy affect the local communities? What do the communities need? And how do we use um, local resources and the environmental resources as a source of peace rather than a source of conflict between communities, right? Um, Jose also interned at Oxfam America, where he studied environmental problems in the oil industry. And he also interned with the World Resources Institute, where he did um, impact assessment in the environmental field as well. So as you can tell, even though Jose did not come to SIS with an international affairs degree, his petroleum engineering background was actually extremely important um, and informative for studies in the environmental policy field. After SIS, Jose um, actually became a senior env environmental specialist at the Inter-America Development Bank in Washington, D.C., which is where he is today. Um, so Jose's path is, is um, you know, has been very focused on the environmental field in the global context. And the last story I want to share with you is the story of Safi, who is originally from Afghanistan. So Safi received his bachelor's degree um, from Pakistan, and he also went on to get an MBA from India. So for those of you who may be thinking about, you know, your quote unquote non-traditional degrees, right, because you didn't necessarily come from political science or international relations field, um, know that we do have many students like Safi that come in with a very different set of skills and credentials. Um, and Safi, in addition to his degrees, he also worked for USAID as a media analyst and worked on issues related to security and governance. During his time at the school, he actually um, was part of the executive master's program because this is a degree for people with at least seven years of work experience. He worked on international development issues and simultaneously, he worked um, for Islamic Relief USA, where he um, managed a $3 million um, dollar portfolio for women's empowerment, health, and food security. After graduate school, um, Safi got a promotion, and he has since been working full-time at Islamic Relief USA as an interprogram uh, international programs manager. So he is now um, managing a much larger portfolio um, of you know, development projects, primarily in developing countries. So I want to share these stories with you because Marcella, Jose, and Safi um, have a lot of things in common, being not necessarily traditional international affairs students, right? Number one is that they are a little non-traditional. Um, they bring different experiences to the table all the way from petroleum engineering to law. And number two is that all of them engaged in cross-sector work. So what that means is that you know, they didn't necessarily stay in the same sector, right? Some of them worked in nonprofit and then they went on to work in um, an international organization. Some of them worked in, you know, the, the public sectors in their home country, and then they went on to work perhaps in the private sector. Um, even though their career path and their passions stayed consistent throughout their time, um, at SIS before and after, but they were able to get their experiences across a different set of organizations and sectors. And what is also important here is that they bring a truly interdisciplinary perspective to the table. Oftentimes we tell our students that, you know, for the field of international relations, if there's a military situation, the military alone cannot solve the problem, right? We must have historians, anthropologists, as well as policy analysts working together hand in hand to have that interdisciplinary perspective. And last but not least, Marcella, Jose, and Safi all had a very clear vision 
for what they wanted to do. Now, it doesn't mean that we are all going to have that vision, right, the day we graduate from college. But this is something that they've been um, cultivating for a number of years, and they figured out the way to create a path that ultimately would work towards that vision. Um, so, so it is really important that as you think about your next steps for graduate education, think about what is the vision that you want to create for yourself, right? Because we all know that you are not here just to get a degree. You're here to think about a greater cause um, of which your degree is a part. And we'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. So, so um, the, the issue of vision or a mission for yourself is really based on the idea that, you know, within any organization, um, and graduate school is a very good example of that, is that when you are part of that organization, you want to understand what is the bigger calling, right? What is it that you're working towards? And for those of you who are working as a, as a professional right now in Colombia or elsewhere, you know, oftentimes what that means is you are doing a job, but you want to understand the greater purpose behind your job. The same is true for graduate school, is that our students are not just here to get a degree, but they actually think about the communities they want to serve after they graduate. They want to think about the challenges they want to be um, a part of, they want to be the solution of um, once they graduate, right? So ask yourself as you think about graduate studies is what is the mission and vision for you? At SIS, we are very much a mission-driven institution. Um, we talk about service to humanity. Um, we talk about social justice. We talk about waging peace versus war. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to go through the long list here, but it's really important to understand as you look for graduate schools is that what is the mission of that graduate school and what do they live for? And, and the mission and purpose are really the things that are channeled into the programs you have, the curricular offerings that you will um, be a part of, right? So it's really important to think about the big picture as you think about your individual journey. So, um, so we want to think about, you know, as, as you discover your journey, what are the program options that can help take you there? At SIS, um, you will see that we have a big spread of graduate degrees that help serve that purpose. Um, we have students that want to focus on comparative and regional studies because they want to, um, you know, develop their expertise in a particular region of the world, Latin America, Africa, Asia, um, Europe, so on and so forth. And we also have students that are interested in environmental policy, as, it, as is the case with Jose from Ecuador, right? And we also have students that are really into international trade and finance, and they really want to get, in, get into the quantitative aspect of, of that. Um, so we have a degree in international economic relations that helps them achieve that. Um, so there's a whole range of options under the umbrella of international affairs. Um, and this is why we think that, you know, for a lot of students who are coming from a variety of degrees, um, you know, we have a lot of choices for you, right? And this is also true if you look into similar degrees in the U.S. I think that the, the, the spread of choices will vary from school to school. So it's really important to figure out what's, what is the issue, the global issue that you are really passionate about, and then research on the schools that can help you get there. So um, this is a slightly closer look at the actual curriculum of a graduate degree at SIS, and you will find similar versions of that at other schools. Um, so within SIS's curriculum, if you think of your degree as a building, right, I always say that a building has multiple building blocks. Um, so for an SIS degree, you have core courses that you need to take, which are the foundational courses for your degree. You have economics, research methods, and you have an area of concentration that allows you to kind of design your degree to something that you are excited about. So for example, you are in the International Economic Relations Program, and you actually want to look at trade and finance issues in Latin America. And this is where the concentration area is where you get to take courses, from a different program at the school so that you design your own international economic relations program in the direction that that resonates with you. 
Um, you also have some electives that you get to take, which are courses that are um, related to your degree, but are not necessarily um, within the School of International Service. So if, let's say, you want to take a course from the business school, you absolutely have the freedom to do so. And your program is going to end in something called the capstone. And that is essentially a final project um, that, that, um, that reflects the best of everything you have learned from your degree, right? Oftentimes, your capstone can be done in the form of a consulting project. So we give you a client. You work with a client, um, but you also work in a group of about 10 to 12 students to solve that problem for the client. Um, so that is sort of a really good way to think about how to get connected to the professional world before you leave your graduate degree. Now, at SIS, um, and you will see other examples at other schools as well, is that we really care about building your concrete skills. We don't want you to come to grad school just learning the theories, right? Because we have enough of that in academia. It's really important that we help you build concrete skills as you take your regular courses. So how do we do that? We talked about the practicum, which is the consulting project you do near the end of your degree. And we have some examples here um, on what the topics are for the practicum. And like I said, we will um, give you a real world client which is a real world organization um, for your practicum and you will apply for the practicum and then be selected for it. So some of the clients we've had in the past includes the US government, um, the Environmental Protection Agency, World Resources Institute um, and the World Bank and the defense industry and many more. Now, what we also do is to help you build your skills, we offer you a number of workshops called Skills Institutes. And these are, by definition, not necessarily taught by SIS professors, but by practitioners and um, experts in the field. So, for example, we have someone that comes in and teaches you how to do data visualization, right? So whether you are in international affairs or a slightly different field, um, this is a very data-driven world we live in right now. So knowing the skills for that is cru uh, crucial. Um, we teach you about how to do business. Um, across, um, you know, uh, how to do cross-sector partnership. So how does the government public entities work with the private entities for um, collective business goals, right? And then we also teach you things like how to write a policy memo, because sometimes to write a one-page um, summary can be much more difficult than writing a five-page paper. Okay. So one other thing that we pay a lot of emphasis on, um, and this will be true for many schools at the graduate level, is that we aren't just teaching you things in the classroom. We actually want to help you build a professional presence and a professional identity the day you start your graduate school, right? So how do you create your LinkedIn profile or any other version of the profile on other platforms where um, global clients tend to access, right? And how do you um, learn from alumni who have graduated from the school so that they can teach you about the tips and tricks for each industry before you get out into the real world. We help you fix your resume. We help you conduct interviews um, so that when you are in front of an employer, you will be ready um, for the questions and answers, right? And we also organize visits for you to go and check out those organizations themselves. Those are just some of the examples. So I want to um, spend a, qu a quick few minutes going over the application portion of it. Um, which, as you will see, are um, similar to many of the um, other graduate schools processes. So an online application for SIS, two letters of recommendation for the master's program, three for PhD. You need to upload a resume, a personal statement. We actually give you three specific questions that you need to answer. And know that every graduate school is a little different. Some schools will have a completely open-ended personal statement and SIS has three questions that we want you to answer. Um, official transcripts. So you will work with your undergraduate institution to have the official transcript sent to SIS. Um, a lot of universities these days are issuing electronic transcripts. And that is totally okay. If they're able to do that, we will not ask for a paper transcript. Um, you will have an application fee submitted into the system. Um, for master's candidates, you do not need the GRE, but you do need the TOEFL or the IELTS or the PT or Duolingo at the bottom of the page. The GRE is required if you are a PhD candidate. 
Um, quickly, application deadline, January 15th, um, is the main date that students are looking at for master's application for the fall semester, and the bulk of our students apply in the fall. For PhD, it's December 15th, and uh, it is a hard deadline, so everything you, you need for your application has to be received by this date. Um, application for funding, I know students are always interested in that. So every school is different. Um, some schools will ask you to submit a separate application for scholarship, but for SIS, you do not need to do that. You submit one and one application only. As long as your application is submitted by the deadline, um, you will be considered for scholarship and funding. SIS funding comes in various forms, right? Some of them are partial tuition assistance, and some of them are a research or teaching assistantship that allows you work, uh, to work with an SIS faculty member. Um, we are also a partner with other funding programs, and CoFuturo has been a partner for many years. Um, so if you are selected for CoFuturo funding, as Bianca explained, you will be eligible for 50% of your tuition from SIS as well. Um, so you do need to um, understand the timeline um, a little bit, right? Because typically you will hear from SIS with your admissions decision about March. And I believe at that point, you have not yet heard from Kofuturo with their decision. So if you um, were not awarded 50% of funding, or if you were not awarded funding from SIS initially, and then you receive Kofuturo, then you need to come back to us with um, the Kofuturo scholarship letter so that we can award you the 50% of tuition. And SIS is a home, also home to a lot of Fulbrighters from Colombia and other parts of the world. Um, and I know that many of our students are actively exploring different funding options. Um, this is a quick slide for where to send your application materials. And since we'll be sharing the slides with you after the webinar, um, you don't need to worry about writing these down. So other things, other ways to connect with SIS if you're interested in learning more about the program and, and actually sign up for an application workshop where we can talk to you in depth, um, the link is right up here, american.edu slash SIS slash visit. And then with that, I have, um, this is the end of my portion of the presentation with my contact information and I'm gonna kick it over to Bianca. Wonderful, Gia. Thank you so, so much for your presentation. Um, David, if you're there, I would actually like to hear a little bit about your experience. We had a couple of people through social media asking about your experience. So if you can just tell us how the process was from being selected as a Futuro recipient and then um, starting this program at American University, that would be great. And then um, everyone that's online, if you want to start sending in your questions, we'll hit those at the end. Ok, hola a todos. Eh, ¿En español? Sí, ¿verdad? No, uh, para contarles un poco de mi experiencia con Colfuturo y con American University, yo apliqué por primera vez en 2019 a American University, pre-pandemia. Eh, por motivos financieros no, no pude iniciar mi máster en esa época, entonces empecé a aplicar a Colfuturo para tratar de obtener eh, el, el beneficio que tienen en cuanto a tuition y también el beneficio pues, del crédito beca. Eh, en mi primera aplicación no, no fui seleccionado, apliqué nuevamente, eh, tampoco fui seleccionado y en la, tercera, eh, en la tercera aplicación sí fui seleccionado y además tenía una beca de, de American University del 25%. Eh, una vez empecé la maestría, eh, como les contaba allí, American University subió mi, mi beca del 25% al 50% por ser eh, beneficiario de Colfuturo y básicamente durante este año y medio que llevo, Colfuturo se ha encargado de pagar directamente mi tuition a la universidad, entonces no tengo que preocuparme por ese tema de los giros. La experiencia en American University ha sido muy, muy, muy enriquecedora. Desde que empecé, mis profesores han sido personas muy top dentro de, del tema de, de, los, de las relaciones internacionales. Eh, he tenido la oportunidad de tener dos profesores que han sido ex embajadores de Estados Unidos en, en, en varias partes del mundo. Tuve una profesora que fue embajadora en Irak, que estuvo en Afganistán. Tuve un profesor que fue embajador en México y en Argentina, muy, muy, muy relacionado con, con el tema de Colombia. Entonces ha habido cierta cercanía. Ahorita estoy viendo una clase sobre 
mediación y, y construcción de paz que la está dando un profesor que trabajó en el proceso de paz de Colombia, eh, enviado por las Naciones Unidas. Entonces, la, la experiencia en American University ha sido muy enriquecedora desde ese punto de vista. Eh, todas las personas son, a, a, han, han estado bien preparadas y, y son eh, top en, 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 su, en su área de conocimiento, entonces eso aporta mucho valor. Eh, además, la facultad es una facultad muy inter, intercultural, hay personas de todo el mundo, entonces uno tiene compañeros americanos, pero también tiene compañeros eh, de Afganistán, de, de Medio Oriente, eh, de Latinoamérica, entonces eso hace aún más enriquecedor cada una de las clases. Maravilloso, muchísimas gracias, David. And Gia, I actually have a question coming through social media about the ideal candidate for these programs. What do you look for in the admissions process for someone that's going to be in this program? Good question. Um, obviously, you are headed into a rigorous graduate program in the field, right? So first and foremost, you know, we want our applicants to come in with a strong level of academic performance and potential. Um, But, but what is almost as important, right, is the fact that you are coming to the school with a vision and a purpose, which is something that I talked about in the presentation, right, is understanding that um, is the ability to articulate to the committee, why is it that you're applying for this particular program at this particular school, because every program at every school is different. Um, the fact that you've done some research about the community that you want to be a part of, Um, is a way for us to assess, right, if this is the right fit for you, um, and if we're able to offer the kind of knowledge and information that you're looking for. So number one is academics, and number two is sort of just the mission and vision behind your degree. Um, and, and, you know, we also say that if you have relevant experience that you can bring to the school, um, that will always make you a stronger candidate. But we define relevant experience not always traditionally, right? We talk about, you know, we have students that may have interned with the UN, which is great, but there are students that have worked in sectors that can inform the field of international affairs that we don't always think about. So for example, you know, we used to have a student who was a clinical psychologist, um, so completely in the sciences field. And then um, she came to SIS wanting to study peace and conflict resolution with a focus on negotiation. And in that particular instance, your clinical psychology background is actually very helpful for negotiation, right? So, so it's we are not always a traditional school. We want to be thinking openly about what each discipline can contribute to the field. So be thinking about that sort of relevant connection if there is one and do a good, a really good job of explaining that to the committee, so. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And then the other question that we have are the language requirements. What are the TOEFL or IELTS scores that are needed for an international student? Yes, um, the TOEFL scores are 100 on the IBT. The IELTS test is seven. It cannot be 6.5. It has to be seven. Um, and then if you take the Duolingo, it's 120. There's also the Pearson test of English, which I don't think many of our students actually take, but if you do, it is 68. So, and I believe Duolingo has become a much more accessible and affordable form of testing for a lot of our students. So um, if you have that in, you know, within your access, um, that is totally something that you can explore. Perfect. Thank you so much. And then I have another question for David. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience, you know, finding housing? Are you living on campus? Um, is, is the city accessible to you? Tell us a little bit about your experience. Ok, perfecto. Eh, bueno, los estudiantes de maestría no tienen permitido vivir on campus. Eso es solo para los que están en undergrad, cursando pregrado. Entonces, eh, todos los estudiantes de maestría debemos vivir por fuera. Eh, yo vivo solo en una parte de estudio que me queda muy cerca del metro. La universidad provee eh, dentro de la matrícula, está, está, está incluido un pase para el metro para viajar en metro gratis todo el semestre. Y eso incluye los buses eh, y todo el, todo el sistema de metro de la ciudad, entonces se vuelve bastante accesible. Eh, la universidad tiene una, una estación de metro que se llama Tenley Town, que ahí te recoge un bus y te lleva directamente al campus principal. Entonces, es un commute fácil, o sea, es, 
es fácil llegar, no, no tiene problema. Hay muchos estudiantes que viven eh, eh, con roommates, eh, la universidad también tiene un portal en Facebook donde se puede buscar eh, roommates para vivir en conjuntos, apartamentos, aparte estudios, y digamos que la zona que rodea la universidad es bastante estudiantil, entonces hay bastantes opciones de vivienda. Eh, lo, lo que yo recomiendo es antes de, si deciden venir a American University y deciden mudarse a Estados Unidos, mi recomendación es antes de, de venir, tener opciones eh, para llegar y hacer visitas y buscar bastantes lugares, bastantes apartamentos eh, y ya venir con citas programadas para buscar residencia eh, y eso va, 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 va a facilitar mucho el, el proceso, normalmente uno se demora aproximadamente, yo le, le, le calculo unas tres semanas en hacer todas esas visitas, pasar la aplicación, porque tienes que hacer una aplicación para que te, para que te aprueben el apartamento que vas a, que vas a arrendar eh, y poder mudarse. Entonces es bueno venir con algo ya, ya visto o hablado con alguien por, por, por redes sociales para, para vivir juntos o si, van, si la decisión es vivir solos, pues tener varias citas de, de apartamentos o apartos estudios donde que, que puedan llegar y visitarlos. Muchísimas gracias, David. Excelente. Bueno, parece que no tenemos más preguntas, entonces terminaremos aquí con el webinar. Muchísimas gracias a todas las personas que se conectaron. Por favor, recuerden que el convenio que tenemos con American University, la verdad, es una maravillosa oportunidad. Como contaba David, es 50% del valor de la matrícula, si es que son seleccionados como beneficiarios de, de Colfuturo. Para postularse al programa de crédito beca, pueden entrar a colfuturo.org, hacer clic en programas, luego en programa crédito beca y podrán ver toda la información, pero desde ahorita les puedo contar que la convocatoria abre el 10 de enero, estará abierta hasta el 28 de febrero y los resultados saldrán el 11 de mayo. Cualquier pregunta, aquí estamos a las órdenes. Gia, thank you so much for being here today. This presentation was absolutely wonderful. And David, thank you so much for your time and for telling us your story as a Gol Futuro recipient. So I hope everyone has a great night and thank you for being here. Bye, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Chao, gracias.